Welcome back to the Poker Vlog, all 888 of you fellow poker junkies. We got another good episode for you. Recently I realized I have a problem. I want to share that problem with you. I decided to do so while driving in the car in the dark at night on the way to the casino. Alright guys, so we just grabbed our coffee and we're heading in to play some 3-5. I just wanted to talk with you guys really quick because part of this channel, you know, is the, it's pretty dark on the screen, I hope you don't mind. It is the uh, mentality, I have that motto that I use, try to use in life, which is never best, always learning. And the reason that I say that all the time is it, it truly is, I think, how we, it just benefits you so much to approach life that way, right? Like if, if you think you're the best dad, poker player, uh, employee, business owner, whatever it is, like you, the moment you think you've arrived, I think you are really setting yourself up for failure. And we always just need to like find a place of humility to build from. So the place of humility I find myself in right now that I'm trying to build from is I'm looking at my year of 2022 and knowing that I've played better poker in the past and made done, done a little bit better hourly and things like that. Uh, it really stood out to me that I'm playing hands that are like on the margins of a normal opening range, like kind of the weakest stuff that I don't need to play. And I'm playing it because I want to get footage for the vlog, right? I want to have stuff to show to you guys. I want you to be like, yeah, this is, this is awesome. Really enjoy, you know, seeing lots of hands. I get, I get comments quite a bit that, you know, people are really interested in seeing long vlogs with a lot of content. So I find myself being like, well, you know, 7-9 suited isn't really, my thing's kind of drifted here. 7-9 suited isn't really ideal, but <laughs> I'm gonna make the move, I'm gonna make the call, whatever, so that I have footage. And I'm gonna start cutting that out of my game. I think it's a disservice to me and to you guys. Uh, I make less money, which is a dis, you know, it's a disservice to me. But then for all of you that are supporting the channel through Patreon, I'm kind of cutting you short, right? Like I'm trying to get footage, but now I'm making less money. So I'm giving away less in giveaways. So that's not good. Uh, and additionally, some of you out there who started with me from the beginning, or maybe you've seen kind of the early stuff and it's been something that's intrigued you is the thought of what is it like to play poker all the time, to play full time? You want to know what kind of money can I make if I'm playing cards consistently? Man, I look evil right now, but <laughs> the lights from the car in front of me. It's not exactly flattering lighting. Um, anyway, you guys want to, you know, the, some of you out there are thinking like, what can I make hourly? What if I play this game long enough and I study hard enough? What can I expect to make? Can I pay my bills? And I'm not giving you a fair shot to know that. I'm, I mean, what I made this year making 40 some an hour, you can pay your bills on that probably but I could show you that you could make more if I'm disciplined. And so I think I'm giving you, like I'm shortchanging you on the reality of what you could do if I wasn't being such a such an idiot, such a dummy out there trying to play too many hands. So there might not be quite as many hands because I'm gonna trim some of the fat, but uh, hopefully in the end that leads to better quality for the wins, better quality for the hands, and just better information in general. All right, let's get into this session of 3-5 and be disciplined. <laughs> I'll see you on the other side of it. Let's go. Bomb pops. Our first hand is King of Spades, Seven of Spades, with the entire table going to a flop of Queen of Spades, Eight of Spades, Deuce of Hearts. The cutoff bet's $60. I make the call and everyone else folds. We don't have to wait at all in this one. The turn is immediately the Six of Spades, giving us the second nuts and the cutoff slows down and checks. Let's go for some value. We can target as two pairs and sets, things like that, that are gonna be happy with the flop and not so happy with the turn. I bet $125. The cutoff looks frustrated, shakes his head, and throws his cards into the muck. The plan was to play some premium hands this session. We might as well start with the best available. The table's been calling and going multi-way often, so when this one straddled the 10, I make it $50 under the gun, hoping to reduce the field. I still get three callers, and we see a flop of king of spades, nine of clubs, three of spades. Since they're really sticky, they're calling a lot, big bets pre and post flop, I'm gonna go ahead and bet three quarters of a pot here, which is way bigger than I would normally go 
in this spot. I bet $150 to try to get value from a king. Unfortunately, the table folds, but I think if a player had a decent king, they would have called this bet, and that's why I made it. And now, it's the hand of the session. It's the hand of the session. All right, this hand's going to take some explanation. So I've seen multiple calls at this table of 9 to 10x preflop, 5 to 6 players calling that size bet. Therefore, I'm not really able to thin the field without putting a huge bet out there. Since that's the case, I make a play that I almost never make. I limp to try to find a set. You could argue that I should probably fold, and I would say that's probably correct. But I thought, you know, I'm going to go ahead and allow them to set a smaller price than what I'm going to end up opening to, and they're all going to call anyway. I don't know. It feels so dirty. I don't like it. Anyway, I ended up limping, which I don't really love. Middle position ends up raising to $35, and there are three calls in front of me. I close the action, so we're going five ways to a flop. The flop is 8-4 deuce rainbow. It checks to the preflop raiser, who continues for $60. He's a very capable opponent, and I think he can have a lot of different things here. He can definitely have us beat with some kind of solid overpair, but I think he can make this bet. Uh, it's a really small bet, and I just don't think this board is connected well. I think he can do it with a lot of over cards that have missed. And so I'm not going to fold yet. It folds back around to me, and since it shouldn't hit him very hard, I go ahead and make the call. The turn is a 10, and I check, and he decides to check back now. So his range just condensed greatly. He just went from having all these awesome over pairs and a top pair to not so much. Maybe he has like ace-8, maybe he has over cards, and he just wants to see a free one. My guess is that his range composition is mostly unpaired over cards here. Something like ace-king, ace-queen. The river is another 10. Interesting. It's actually a phenomenal card for us. He would have bet top pair on the turn if he had it, and he didn't bet, so he probably doesn't have a 10. If he has an 8, he might stick around and call, but if we were ahead of him before, chances are we're still ahead now. I could check and allow him to bet, but I think that I prefer to lead this river. By doing this, I get to set my price for the river that I would be calling anyway. I have the potential to get a fold from some slightly better hands that I would lose to if I were to check, and it gives me the possibility to get value from a light call. I could see playing this either way, but I go ahead and lead for $125. My opponent is a solid player and thinks on this one for a while. It looks like I have air or something great here, when in fact I have neither. <laughs> After tanking for a long time, he decides to call, announcing ace high. I really like that he took the time to consider this and that it does look bluffy and that he was willing to make the call here because it looks like I'm just making a stab with either something really good, some kind of monster hand, or absolute error. We end up getting some great value in a spot that might have gone check check, but also could have potentially been a large river bluff if he was feeling aggro. I'm curious to hear what you guys think. Comment below and tell me what you would have done. Sticking to our plan of playing the best hands possible during this session, we pick up pocket kings. There are two limpers and I raise to $40 at the sticky table from the small blind. Two players make the call. The flop looks nice for pocket kings. Jack of clubs, seven of hearts, four of hearts. I lead out for $75 to charge jacks and flush draws. Both players end up making the call. Come on, let's see a good turn card. Turn is the ultimate blank, a deuce of diamonds. Beautiful. I size up on this turn, looking for a call from a strong jack that stuck around on the flop and is not afraid of this deuce. I bet $250 into the $345 pot, and both players fold. Again, this was a sticky table. They were making big calls when they had it. The sizing's a little bit large, but I'm comfortable taking the pot down, and if I'm gonna get a call, I wanna charge them to see another card. Many people out there will tell you that there's no right way to play pocket jacks. Don't believe those filthy liars, and prepare to subscribe out of the gratitude for the information that I'm about to share with you. This is how to play pocket jacks. Just do this. Raise to $40 over a limp at a sticky 3-5 game and get three callers. Then, when the flop comes down jack, 4-5, bet $115 and get a caller. Then, when the turn is a 6, continue betting, this time for $300, and get a second call. The river will be an 8, bringing in every imaginable draw, but clearly it won't matter when you check back and your opponent turns up pocket kings that chose not to re-raise you pre-flop, 
and allow you to hit that set. You aren't convinced? All right, well, try this instead. Raise to $45 over a couple of limpers from middle position. Get three callers again, but this time, simply flop a full house on 333. Easy. Bet your boat, everyone folds, scoop your pot. Jacks are easy, just follow my recommendations. Those hands went back to back and then were followed by this, and you can hear now that the table's starting to get tired of me. Sometimes it just shows up. Two, three, three. Uh, yeah. two, three, yes. <laughs> I just went by the river, like one of the, yeah, King or Jack. Just when probably you have play, to yeah. start bullying now, huh? They just keep showing up. You gotta watch the vlog later. It's just two, three, seven, three, uh, nine, four. Four. Crazy. <laughs> the threes. I got, I got three, four suited. I got seven, five off suit. They're just showing up. They're just showing up. <laughs> All the hands. Now we play a hand that is actually difficult to play instead of those easy pocket jacks. We get ace, king off suit. Early position raises to $20, and I make it $65 to isolate the original razor. If earlier in this episode you thought to yourself, geez, what's wrong with this guy? Why is he betting so much? Well, to further demonstrate the table dynamics, I get five. Yes, five callers. <laughs> Our family reunion-sized group goes to a flop of queen, queen, seven with two spades. I am done with this hand, even if we pair up. Action checks through. Turn is the six of clubs. The small blind bets $300 and shows ace queen when we all fold. Finally, I'd like to hear what you would do in this one. I'm terrible when it comes to playing bomb pots. I'll tell you what I did and then you can comment below and tell me what I should have done. Our hand is six nine offsuit and the flop is four five seven rainbow. We're open ended with the draw to the nuts if the top end comes in. The player to my right bets 65. I could raise here maybe because I have that potential, but typically in these bomb pots from my experience, a, a player who's gonna be taking any kind of an action has like two pair or a set almost every single time if they don't have the flop straight. So chances are I'm behind. Anyway, I make the call, which eh, I think it's okay. I wanna see what develops. The cutoff now raises to $360. So there's a kind of a question there. Should I even be calling if I, even though I'm open-ended, there's a decent chance that, I don't know. I, I, I think the call's okay, but tell me what you think. Anyway, I'm folding since he likely has the cards that I would need. He probably has flopped the straight. Another player calls, and then the turn ends up being an eight, so we would have had the nuts. Crap! I don't know. I just don't think there's any way that we should be ever calling the 360. So, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's a point that I could have played this better. Tell me what you think. If you have a strategy that would have worked better on this, let me know. All right, well, it's been about three and a half hours and I gotta get going, so I end up wrapping this up, taking away $1,171 that used to belong to other people. Uh, that means that we have a giveaway of $117 as your cut as supporters of this channel. I divided that into three $39 gift cards and they are going out to the following supporters. R Bar, Dave and Max, and Jinx Morris. Your names have been drawn this time around. Thanks for supporting the channel. Money is coming your way. Congrats guys on the win. Total giveaways are now up to $767. Click below if you want to support the channel and get your piece of that action. All right guys, that's a wrap on episode number 25. I hope you had a good time. I know I sure enjoyed putting this together for you. I hope you enjoyed watching it. If you want another one to watch, there's one right there. Go ahead and give it a click. Otherwise, until next time, go crush your table and I'll talk to you again soon.